getting started early this year. Gonna do a couple of quick reviews. Okay, so, um, I, I'm gonna still do the two, I'm still gonna do two Halloween reviews. I'm getting started in September this year because fuck you. I like Halloween. All right, so, um, thing I got into this year, ooh, mask is falling off. I got into SCP, but not through the wiki. So I found a song um, that's actually just sort of a slight remix of an existing pop song based on an SCP animation series. I'm going to play it at the end because uh, it's a really good song and you should listen to it. Oh no, the mask! And in my searching for horror mangas, one thing that came up was this thing called Oversimplified SCP, which is basically just a bunch of little SCP shorts in a very simple, chibi art style. I think it's actually from Japan, so apparently SCP is this big thing that's been around for a while and I'm just catching up now. But I don't care, it's really fun! Now the manga isn't properly scary most of the time, it's actually funny a lot of the time. Which I think really does nail into the appeal of SCP. The appeal of SCP is that it kind of nudges at the uh, paradox or the that doesn't make sense part of your brain. It actually, um, a lot of it reminds me of the sort of portal style of humor, where in the first one more so than the second one. In the first one, there's this niggling wrongness about everything that's happening and a bunch of kind of funny corporate speak that's clearly covering up something obviously sinister and bad. And that's kind of the thing that SCP is, you know, nudging at. Or if there were, in some, um, I'd say, Half-Life comedy bits, when you'd learn about the, um, what the hell was the name of that facility? Black Mesa, the Black Mesa facility. It's kind of in that vein, and the SCP hits that target so well, and is occasionally really terrifying because there's a lot of really creative ideas going on here. Now the manga's got a cute art style. It's simple, it's basic, but it's evocative. Like the first thing they do is this statue that's basically a weeping angel. If you don't look at it, it's gonna move really fast and break your neck. But um, that's, I, I like there's like a better picture that someone rendered of it at some point and uh, it's really, you know, a matter of taste which version you prefer. I kind of like the simple aesthetic that lets my brain fill in a lot of the details with the descriptions just kind of giving me the overlook. The overview. And it's clear that the author is like kind of playing around with the laws of SCP. Like, okay, one thing that's early on in the series is the hard to kill lizard. It's just a big, smart lizard that's really hard to kill. It takes a beating, it regenerates, and it's, uh, it's just, they just haven't figured out how to kill it. They hold it in, like, a ba a, a pool of hydrochloric acid, I think it is, and if it ever escapes, they're supposed to just beat it up and just throw it back in the pool, and uh, a good running gag that they keep using is that if they introduce some new, very dangerous thing, they'll pair it with the murderous, uh, no, they'll pair it with the hard-to-murder lizard to see what happens. So they put it in the room with the statue that breaks your neck if you stop looking at it, and the lizard does not break eye contact for 20 solid minutes. So that doesn't work. And then there's this big, like, long-armed, hulking Sundere monster. I say Sundere because if you ever see its face, it gets embarrassed and beats you to death. And, um, they... They're in the room, and the lizard sees its face, and I assume the lizard's like this big, like big human size, uh, like small human size, huge for a lizard. Like, I guess bipedal Komodo dragon, maybe? It, the, the, the drawings aren't very specific. But anyway, it's thrown into the room with the monster that beats you to death if it sees your, if you see its face. And 20 minutes later, the monster decides it can't kill the lizard, and the lizard is like badly beaten up in the corner, but not dead. And later they introduce this girl who has this really weird thing going on where she has to do anything anyone orders her to do, but she will always fail at what they order her to do. So, like, one relatively clever test is they tell her, flip a coin so that it lands on heads. And she flips a coin and it lands on the edge. Okay. <laughs> 
Wasn't expecting that. So they tell her to beat up the lizard until it is 200% dead. And she just like grabs it and starts wailing it against the ground until eventually the lizard tells her to murder it and it, she stops because I guess she can't murder the lizard. Yeah, the lizard can talk. Um, the lizard is a reoccurring character as the story progresses. Like, there's this bell with no hammer and if you ring it, a magical butler shows up and he will do whatever you order him to do uh, with great speed and alacrity. And they ask him, kill the lizard, and he's like, unfortunately, I cannot. Although, if I were to suicide bomb the hell out of it, I would damage it. Would that satisfy you, master? Um, they don't have him do that, because I don't think they can get him back. So there's a lot of cool stuff like that. There's a girl who only exists inside two-dimensional drawings. She doesn't know that. And, you know, she can move between pieces of paper if they're next to each other, and she takes on the style of whatever she's inside of. And then she finds out what she is, and she gets all depressed about it. Oh. There's a girl whose power is literally to manifest anything she imagines that she can see in front of her. Um, they're absolutely terrified of that girl. They've got this rating scale. Uh, safe, Euclid, Kepler? Kepler, maybe? I can't remember, but it's like, it's like a three-point rating scale. Safe is not particularly dangerous, just weird, and we don't want people knowing about it. Uh, Euclid is dangerous, do not mess, and Kepler is potentially world-ending dangerous. Like, we're keeping this on lock because it's so dangerous. And that does lead to one of the legitimately creepy ones that they have. So it's like this rotting old man, it's doing like the stereotypical old man Japanese walk with its like hand behind its back holding up its like spine or whatever. Um, it can phase through matter, and anything it touches will rot. That's a problem. Holding it in a room is, one, impossible because it can leave whenever it wants. It just phases through, like, it enters a dimensional portal and exits a dimensional portal somewhere else. So you can't hold it. And uh, even if you did just want to keep it in a room so you know where it is and if it's gone somewhere, the room starts to melt eventually. So that's a problem in terms of containment. Uh, SCP is Secure, Contain, Protect, which honestly I think is a really bad acronym, like, because they refer to everything with like a code name, SCP-0852, and that means Secure, Contain, Protect, Number 0852. I don't know. I feel like they should be more like an item number rather than a verbiage. But anyway, this old man uh, eats people. Uh, he only goes for men 10 to 25, they don't know why, they just have observed that that's what he does, and grabs them, throws them in his portal, and eats them while they're in the portal. And the containment method for this guy is quite literally grab an employee, throw of his target age range, throw them in his containment cell, and break their legs loudly into a speaker broadcast around the room until like because that some like that's a like a dinner bell for him. He's like, ooh, oh, oh, a person in pain. I better get over there and eat them. And that one creeped me out because it it's explicitly something they cannot stop. Like there's other stuff they can't stop. Like there's this giant continent island size, like the size of Madagascar worm that is thankfully asleep because there is nothing they can do about it. But that's sort of like a force of nature. This is more like a monster that they have no idea how to stop. And the best they've done is monitor it and feed it so it doesn't eat indiscriminately. Because after it's eaten the person crying in pain, it goes into like a hibernation cycle for a little while. So they're quite literally killing their employees just to keep this one monster from wandering indiscriminately across the earth and eating people. Because it could! It could! And their best hope is to just keep people from knowing this is a real thing by sacrificing people every couple months. That's, that's unsettling, that level of, that lack of control, because SCP is all about control. 
And sometimes they can't, and the way it's written down is like, it's very formal documentation most of the time, so when it's obvious that the formal documentation has to admit the powerlessness is, it's off-putting. And it's, it's very fun to read. I've read a bunch of them. They kind of lose steam as it goes on, because it starts getting into like, like there's like a whole set about different chairs with different abilities, and I don't know, that, that's kind of weak. I, I kind of prefer that, like, a couple of items that have non-sentience and just do stuff is neat, but when it's like a whole series in a row, it, it kind of kills the momentum. There was a pretty funny one where it, the phenomenon, it's not really a thing, it's just a thing that happens, is uh, called xenophobia, which it's quite literally just sometimes their employees will just get fucking mulched out of nowhere. No one sees it happening, no one knows why, and it only seems to affect their personnel. Like, it doesn't happen outside in the main world, which is mostly what they're trying to keep people from learning about. Like, they don't want people to know about all the cool, the crazy shit they found. Keeps people, uh, I don't know, standard MIB logic. So it's only killing their employees, so this is an entirely an internal matter. And then one day, a guy, like, sketches what he imagines the phenomenon look like, and he must have been like an anime fan or something because he draws like a Yandare character from like Mirai Nikki and calls it Xenophobe Chan or something. And so that actually stopped the phenomenon from happening for like five months. So they instituted a promotional campaign amongst all the facilities of Xenophobe Chan, and they like came up with an anime OC for her and had her like doing um like you know uh propaganda posters like don't tell anyone your secrets or Xenophobe Chan will get you and uh, that stopped the phenomenon entirely and that's that's really clever like they don't know why but whatever it is being acknowledged and noticed which is why I said it's Sundere notice me it stops this from happening. And what's really cool sometimes is that the notes create a narrative of not just like describing it, but of like the process of SCP coming to terms with this thing they've got. So like, there's a monster that will lock you in a room. It doesn't lock you in a room. What it does is it like just kind of waits outside the door. And it's got like big scary teeth or whatever, but it's, it doesn't actually kill you per se. It just waits outside the door. And unless someone approaches from, like, the opposite direction, like, enters the room that the monster's in and, like, scares it away, the person is, like, terrified. It's, it's sort of like a psychological assault and can't open the exit door. So they had to completely remodel the facility where this thing, like, spawns so that every room has two entrances and has two doors in and out. Because if there's only one door, they did absolutely have one guy just starve to death because he got locked in the room and couldn't get out before anyone, like, noticed. Like, he, he died of dehydration in there. So, that, so stuff like that, where there's, like, a narrative of them learning to deal with this thing and having to, like, build their facilities in such a way that, like, accommodates a monster, not in a way that, like, they understand and that they're completely reactionary to everything that it does. And it is always interesting when there's, like, a Keter class... No, it's not Kepler, it's Keter. I got that wrong earlier. A Keter class monster, like a world-destroying monster, that doesn't seem that bad. Like, there's one, it's a piece of cake. It's literally just a piece of cake. And if a human being eats it, they ate a piece of cake, and then, like, a day later, the plate will refill with a new piece of cake. But that happens whether someone eats the cake or not. So every day, there's a new piece of cake, and each new piece of cake has the same property of spawning new pieces of cake. Ah! <laughs> yeah, you see where this is going. They have to very meticulously cap get every piece of cake and have an employee come down and eat it every day, or else it multiplies geometrically and overwhelms the world in cake. And there's no, like, option to smush it or whatever. If you smush it or something other than a human eats it, it just regenerates itself on the plate instantly. <sighs> or there's a monster whose entire thing is that it shapeshifts into what it thinks will scare people. 
and they very carefully locked this monster in a room where the only thing it gets to see are horror movies from like the 50s. So it's turning into like classic B-movie monsters and coming up to people and going like, Wah! are you scared? And all the employees who interact with this monster have to take acting classes so that it thinks they're scared of it. Because if it's, they basically have to convince it that it's doing a good job. Otherwise it's gonna go out and find out what people are really scared of and there's no known limit to its transformation powers, so it could very easily turn into a really bad thing. Oh, and another cool one that has a narrative is that there's like this broadcast of like a children's television show hosted by Bobo the Clown, except Bobo teaches children how to like torture people and murder them, and like he does it with a smile and it's all kids program, and the kids, if they watch the show too much, will start to imitate his behavior. And adults can't see it, they get knocked out for it, but so they intercept this broadcast every time it comes through and like give it to a kid to watch and describe to them what happened, and then they uh, neuralize the kid. They don't have neuralizers, although I think one time they did that as a joke. Like the author like just says like, Toom! but normally it's like a spray, it's an amnesiac spray, light amnesiac, whatever. Forget the last 30 minutes, not too hard. And so like... In the record, in the description of the recorded episodes, by episode three, Bobo is mad at SCP for intercepting his like broadcast, and just sits for the whole episode staring at the camera. It's like, mm. and then for the fourth episode that's described, he is literally telling, giving instructions on how to invade and expose SCP facilities to children. I mean, the broadcast isn't getting out anyway, so it's not working. But it's funny that he's reacting to being monitored and is mad about it. Like, that's a cool narrative. And occasionally it delves into more, like, basic stuff like Cthulhu. They've got Cthulhu, and Cthulhu doesn't know why, but for some reason Cthulhu inspires cults, just, like, spontaneously, and they break into the facility and try and worship him, and he is not into it at all. He's like, oh my god, you guys are so gross, stop. Oh, why are you carving runes into your flesh? Oh, get out of here with that orgy. I'm not supposed to see that. I'm too young. He's like 200 years old. He's too young for this. <laughs> so, I mean, that's a cute joke. Like, that's a cute spin on it. So, yeah, the SCP comic is fun. I enjoyed it a lot. It's not scary a lot of the times. Maybe, like, the proper SCP, like, wiki can get pretty creepy. But I do feel like... It's most of the stuff I've interacted with is going for that hilarious interplay between unimaginable creative monsters and fantasy and magic slamming into the idea of trying to bureaucratically control and contain these things. Again, that slight wrongness of like the first Portal game is just a really good description, I think, of it. And I had a lot of fun with it, and I'm definitely like, I'm putting a link up here in the corner to that music video. I like that music video, and uh, at the SCP Confinement series is really fun. I wonder if he's like an original creation of that show. I could have looked this up, but it's one of those things where it's more fun the less you know. Like, you just need the basic idea, and then you can just kind of dive in and out of the stories. It's like, it's like, actually, it's like old episodic television, where every episode was just sort of like a spin on the concept and you don't have to be there for the continuity every time. I do see that sometimes in uh, Lovecraftian circles where they try and catalog and categorize everything, and I'm like, wow, is that missing the point. So, hey, gonna keep doing this one every week until uh, October is over, and, uh, well, okay, I'm gonna do six of these. I've counted it out on the calendar. Uh, three, and then a proper full scripted episode, and then another three, and then, like, the Halloween episode, which is... What am I gonna do? I haven't even decided yet, but it's gonna be great. I might do Junji Ito. Bye. Hey, ho, here he goes. Either a little too high or a little too low. Got loads of steam and vertigo, but he thinks he's fine and dandy.